Papua New Guinea uh, with Nina. And we decided, you know, he, he was killed. Uh, his ship, ship, it was a tiny little fishing boat uh, filled with troops, was bombed off the shore of a tiny village called Pangani. So we decided to go there. And we wondered, uh, would anyone still be alive? Uh, you know, 60 years had passed. The average life expectancy in PNG, as it's called, is 45. I thought, probably not, but it's worth a shot. So we went. And this place, uh, I have to tell you, was always in my kind of little pantheon growing up in which I had all these religious kind of uh, icons like his war medals, a globe that had a, a star uh, at Buna, which is close to where he was killed, which I thought the star was put there because that's where he died. Um, uh, this spot, uh, half a mile off the coast of Pangani, was always kind of sacred because my mother claimed that she knew he was killed the instant it happened. Mm. And she elaborated on this story. She was, there was a wedding at our house in Westport at her, and, and she was kind of, the wedding was over, she was cleaning up, and she suddenly felt uh, indescribable emotion. And she knew instantly something wrong had happened. She went outside, sat down under a tree to collect herself and said, my God, he's been killed or wounded. Uh, and the next day, the time's called. So she's always said that there was something in that, in that moment that allowed him to communicate with her all the way, halfway around the world. You know, we, Bob and I, I don't think we really quite believed it. <laughs> On the other hand, we couldn't totally discount it because you don't discount something you hear when you're 8, 10, 12 years old. So when I went to Pangani, um, I went to this little village, uh, and we arrived. We, they knew we were coming. You, you have to always notify people in that part of, in, in that island uh, of your intention before you get there because people run into trouble. Uh, and they greeted us with a, a ceremony and dancing and everything. And then um, we had a long negotiation. Uh, would I be allowed to talk to their elders? Uh, and I was looking around to see, is anyone old enough to, could they have remembered? And everything seemed to go off the track. We had a kind of a, our translator, uh, you know, wasn't, we kept saying, should we pay them money? And he said, no, 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 not now, later. And, but it was clear that they wanted something from us. And the son of the chief, who had spoken a kind of historical way, was saying, our people suffered and the white man has never come back until now. You, you represent America. What are you going to do for us? Uh, you know, and I, I was actually getting angry, uh, thinking all I want to do is talk about them. But then uh, somebody else stepped in, another a man who was kind of our guide, offered them some money, which they took, and suddenly the whole mood changed, and a feast came out, and everybody was, and they presented me with these wonderful necklaces in a ceremony and said, now we are your uncles. Uh, take these, take these home and hang them up in your in your house. And when you look at them, you will think of the two men who saw your father dead, because there were in fact two survivors. One was the chief, who had he was he was kind of barely compass menace, so he wasn't much. But the other was a brother of the chief, who was six years old, on his way to school, remembered the attack, the bombs, went over and. Looked at, the, uh, looked at the bodies. And he took me to the spot where the bodies were. <laughs> and I think at that moment, I felt a connection. Um, these moments which are so deeply personal and, 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 and and one of the, it leads me to a question I wanted to ask you, which is, you know, you've written fiction and you've written about other people's stories. You know, that's what you've done. You've mm -hmm. always told other people's stories. Why did you decide to explore? Uh, and how difficult was it for you to write a person? This is something entirely different than what you've done. Spread a yeah. mental. I think I think everything I've ever written has prepared me for this one book. Yeah. I think the fiction, you know, the characters in there that are sort of taken from real life somewhat, and you kind of smuggle in facts and details from your own life in a form of camouflage, but it's very different to just serve it up as, you know, the real dish. 
So this is totally different. This is not this is not my sixth book. This is my first book, and probably my only book, really. And could you have written this book twenty years ago? No, did I had no interest twenty years ago, and uh, I don't think I would have been capable of doing it. And I'm not sure I had that same notion that above all, the guiding star has to just be honesty, brute, brute, yeah. straightforward, accurate honesty. Um, I get to uh, get John tonight for dinner, so I have t 20 more questions here. <laughs> I want to make sure you all have questions, so I'm just going to do a last question um, so everyone else has time, and then if they're on, I can go back to some of mine. Um, but one of the things that is, is so amazing uh, about John and about his family um, is that while this book is described almost a family, uh, his own family is the family that I'm a part of, uh, is one of the most traditional, uh, deep, uh, loving, and faithful families. And that's true of his brother as well. They've both come through extraordinary circumstances, uh, and they've both um, exceeded and excelled uh, to an enormous degree. And I guess the question I have for you, which also applies for John, is that, I don't want to say how, um, but g given the circumstances without a father, how do you think you were able to become an amazing father, um, a loving father, maintain not almost a family, a true family? Um, where did that come from? And, 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 and while you deconstruct the myth, did the myth help you in any way? Oh. Well, I, I mean, I think uh, even though our father wasn't there, he in a sense was there. I mean, there was a role model. And that model was probably better, in some sense, than having a real father. Uh, very few defects. I'm sure he would have played with us, you know, until the sun went down every night, bounced us on his knee. I can see the whole thing. So it's pretty easy to just model yourself after that. Yeah. Plus, I have to say, I also thought, in a way, I had it a little bit easier, because I thought my brother was the one who really had to kind of be the protector in that situation. And uh, so I kind of tried to perpetuate my childhood and adolescence as long as I could. And I think he was kind of forced to mature very quickly, very rapidly, uh, and bear, I always thought, bear the brunt of it. Um, why don't I open it up to questions, and people can ask anything uh, about the times, about the book, or whatever, and John then will sign books. But uh, yeah. Well, your mother hired me as a copy girl. Oh. And in 19, I was uh, a sophomore at uh, Hunter College, and there was a little notice up in the journalism department saying that they needed a copy girl down at Wings National News Service. And I was desperate to get started on my journalism career. And so I went down, and your mom and her partner, Harriet Crowley. Right. Harry Crowley interviewed me, and they hired me on the spot. And I started working. The, I, I, your mom was absolutely amazing. She yeah. was a great editor. She really straightened me up. I mean, <laughs> I wrote things that I thought were great, and she just ripped them to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I also was there during the time that Harriet lost a child uh -huh. in an accident out east on Long Island, which was a very tragic event in, in the life of both of them. They were very much a partnership. And I knew about you, of course, and I knew about your brother, but uh, I, I never met either of you. I don't think you ever came into the office on 44th, wasn't it? Yeah, we did. We, we did. did. Yeah, well, maybe yeah. I was at school. Yeah. <laughs> um, during that and time, did you go on into journalism? Yes, uh, actually, what happened was I stayed uh, with Women's National News Service, yeah. and I became, uh, I was doing copy after I stopped just being a gopher. I started writing uh, fashion copy, beauty copy, and I became the fashion editor and the beauty editor, yeah. and then I did stories, I did human interest stories, and you know, yeah. we put that thing to bed every night um, and sent it out to, at one point we had, I think like 40 some odd newspapers that we were supplying news for their women's page because they didn't have uh, they mm -hmm. didn't have anybody working to to produce uh, news about women's events and so um, no it was a wonderful experience and then I was 
uh, I didn't realize it when his afternoon service ended uh, because I went on to Seventeen Magazine. I was hired by Seventeen Magazine, mm -hmm. and then I went on to advertising uh, later. But um, my memory of your mother, Eleanor Choate Darnton, is so clear. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I look at the picture in the book, I mean, she's right there in front of me. It's mm -hmm. It just brings back such incredible memories. <laughs> and um, I really appreciated everything she and her partner, Harriet, did for me. And I wanted to tell you, I've been following your career. <laughs> and every time there's anything about you, you know, a review or anything, I always clip it out and save it because yeah. I still have that very strong connection. Oh. Well, know. thank you. Um, yeah. 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 I wish I had met you the, while I was writing it. I, I could have used some of uh, some of the material. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Women's National News Service. The, the quick story there is um, after our mother was uh, women's editor at the Times, while she was, there were these pitched battles with the male editors. At the time, uh, the New York Times was even then well known for not tolerating almost any women. <laughs> and uh, I've discovered a number of memos in the archives in which she is pleading for uh, a, a real look at news of concern to women that went beyond food, fashions, and furnishings. And she shot down in the replies uh, with little notes in the margin. So she got basically fed up and went out and with her partner, Harriet Crowley, established Women's National News Service, news by women, about women, for women. And the idea was they would have client newspapers all around the country, and they did build up a fairly sizable list. But they never got the New York Times to sign up for it, which they felt hurt them uh, badly. And it began losing money, in part because I think you mailed out the stories. The, 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 the idea of having a ticker you know, to the person. <laughs> <laughs> and so here you are, you're running a newspaper in Des Moines, Iowa, and you get this packet in the mail, and you might use it or not, but it's not suddenly topical, you know, because it takes two days to get there. So they were laboring at a disadvantage, and they lost money throughout, and it finally collapsed in bankruptcy in 1954. Mm -hmm. If it had died earlier, it would have been better. But the fact that it died such a slow death meant that I think on both sides they were pouring more and more good money after bad. Huh. Other questions? Any other questions? Um, I, of course, uh, I'm trying to pretend I don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you don't really. Um, I, don't, I, I believe everything I read in the Times, but um, uh, the, the review uh, that um, David mentioned um, uh, in the, in the uh, Sunday book review, extremely, extremely positive, uh, but uh, um, said, um, uh, re referred, referred to numerous villains in the book, including the Japanese and the American pilot who dropped the bomb on the plane. Uh, having read the book, it was not my impression that you, uh, I mean, you know, the Japanese were, were, we, were, were our enemies in war, but uh, I didn't think that you had that reaction to the pilot. Uh, can you describe, uh, can you describe what you, what you thought mm -hmm. about it? Uh, you're, you're right. I, I didn't have that reaction to the pilot. We, uh, we never knew uh, who the pilot was, and my mother in decided she didn't even want to find out. Um, and she said if she had, she would have tried to comfort him, to say she knew accidents happened in war and it wasn't uh, his fault. Um, when I was very young, I kind of uh, uh, confabulated that, that pilot with the pilot of Angola uh, Gay. Uh, because they seemed almost comparable <laughs> events in my mind. And I thought somehow I had heard that the pilot went crazy um, at what he had done. So I, growing up, thought, well, naturally enough, the pilot who, who uh, you know, who, who